Hello everyone. Now that we're done with the axial musculature, let's focus on the appendicular. Therefore, in this lecture, we will talk mainly about the upper limb muscles. Before we get into the muscles, I want to go over these rules that we talked about in the first learning outcome, because these rules will definitely apply for the appendicular musculature. So remember that muscles do have an origin and an insertion, and the muscles will always pull towards the origin. The origin for the appendicular muscles, they're always going to be proximal, meaning that they will always be above. So for example, if we're talking about the upper limb, I know, horrible upper limb, but the origin will always be here on top and the insertion will always be here on the bottom. The muscles, they have to cross at least one joint to be able to pull on that bone. But there are some muscles that do cross two joints. So if they cross two joints, they will do two actions. They will perform an action at one of the joints that is crossing and they will perform another action on the other joint. Next, Muscles can't have an origin and an insertion on the same bone. They need to be crossing at least one joint to be able to perform an action. And the last thing that we didn't cover before, but muscles that are in the same compartment, meaning a group of muscles that are located, for example, anteriorly on the upper limb, they will most likely exert the same function. If they are located posteriorly, they will most likely exert the same function. So it makes it easier for you to remember a function if the muscles belong to the same compartment. So now that we went over all these rules, let's get into the upper appendicular musculature. Muscles of the upper limb, they can be divided into five different groups. The first group is going to include the muscles that move the pectoral girdle. The second will be the muscles that move the arm at the shoulder. The third will be muscles that move the forearm at the elbow. And the fourth one will be muscles that move the hand at the wrist. And the last one will be the muscles that move the digits. Let's start first with the muscles that move the pectoral girdle. If they're going to move the pectoral girdle, they have to be inserting on the pectoral girdle because remember, that the insertion will move towards the origin. So if I'm saying that the first group is muscles that will move the pectoral girdle, this means that the insertion will be either on the clavicle or on the scapula. And the origin will be on the axial skeleton. And these muscles that position the pectoral girdle or that stabilize the pectoral girdle, they're going to make it a steady base on which the other muscles can move the arm. The first muscle that we can talk about is the trapezius. The trapezius is going to originate on the occipital bone and the vertebrae, and it will insert on the scapula and the clavicle. So since it will pull towards the origin, it will move towards the midline. So this means that the trapezius, because it will be pulling on the scapula in this direction, it will be retracting the scapula, and it will also function to elevate the clavicle. Now, the other muscles that pull towards the midline are the rhomboids. There are two rhomboids. You have a minor and a major, and both of them will originate on the midline, so on the vertebrae, and they will insert on the medial border of the clavicle. Therefore, they will pull the clavicle also towards the midline and this will retract the scapula. Now the levator scapulae, like the name says, it will elevate the scapula. So it will bring the scapula up because it originates on the base of the skull. It inserts on the superior border of the scapula. And notice because of its position, it will elevate the scapula. So it's called the levator scapulae. Notice how on the left side of this model, these muscles are more superficial, and on the right side, these muscles are deeper. This means that the trapezius is covering the rhomboids and the levator scapulae. 
Now the muscles that are located anteriorly, which are the pectoralis minor and the serratus anterior, when they pull on the scapula, they will depress the scapula and they will also protract the scapula, bring it anteriorly. Here on this model of a posterior view of the back, we can see the levator scapulae, which is this muscle right over here. And we can see the rhomboids, the minor and the major. Notice how the major is all of this, and the minor would be just this width over here. And also, we can see the trapezius on this side. On this slide, these uh, images, they actually are animations. But for me to be able to play it on this program, I need to insert them on a different slide. So this is what we will see on the next two slides. The muscle that's highlighted here is the rhomboid and see how it retracts the scapula. The muscle that's highlighted here is going to be the levator scapulae and notice how it will elevate the scapula. Here I'm highlighting the serratus anterior and as you can see it will protract the scapula. In our lab model this will be your trapezius that will be covering your rhomboid major and your rhomboid minor. In addition to the levator scapula, you can see a little bit of it over here, and you can see it definitely better right over here. Now we're going to be covering group two, which are the muscles that move the arm at the shoulder. Therefore, the arm is the humerus. So if the arm is moving, that's where the insertion will be. And if it's moving at the shoulder, then the origin will be the clavicle or the scapula. In addition, there are some muscles that move the arm anteriorly that will originate on the sternum. But in general, they do originate on the clavicle and or the scapula. As a general rule, therefore, we can say that the muscles that move the humerus anteriorly are generally located on the anterior side of the body and they will originate on the sternum like the pectoralis major that we see over here or the anterior side of the scapula like the subscapularis as we can see over here. The muscles that move the humerus superiorly they generally will originate from the superior border of the scapula and or the clavicle like the deltoid. And the muscles that move the humerus inferiorly, they're generally originating from the middle or lower back, like the latissimus dorsi. And that's sort of an exception. And we're going to see how that muscle will be able to move the arm. The muscles that move the humerus posteriorly, they're generally located on the posterior side of the body and they will originate on the scapula like for example the infraspinatus as we can see over here. With regards to the muscle, one thing that I want you guys to keep in mind is that when we talk about a function of a muscle, we're talking about the muscle as a whole or what's the main function of the muscle. And I say this because for example the deltoid, which is the first muscle that we will be talking about, it's a really big muscle on the lateral part of the shoulder and the whole muscle will abduct, ABD, the arm at the shoulder. However, because it's a big muscle, we can say that the posterior part of the muscle will do lateral rotation and extension, and the anterior part will do medial rotation and flexion. Because there are lots of little details, especially on big muscles, I want us to focus on the main movement of that muscle. So when we talk about the deltoid, we will say that the deltoid as a whole does abduction. Therefore, it lifts your arm up and moves it away from the waistline. Let's go back to our pectoralis major. As you know, it will originate over here on the sternum and insert on the humerus. Therefore, when it pulls in this direction, it will do three things. It will flex abduct and immediately rotate at the shoulder. So flexion decreases the angle, adduction brings it closer to the body, and immediately rotates the arm. All of this at the shoulder joint. 
Now let's talk about the muscles that are located within the scapula. There are four muscles over here on the posterior side. There's going to be the supraspinatus, which is this muscle over here, the infraspinatus, which is this big muscle right over here, and then you're going to have a teres minor, which is located on the scapula itself, and below the teres minor, you're going to have what we call the teres major. We can see the minor over here, and this would be your teres major. On the anterior side, remember we had the subscapular fossa, and therefore the muscle that's located on the subscapular fossa is the subscapularis. Now four of these five muscles form what we call the rotator cuff muscles. And these muscles are going to be the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and the subscapularis. And what happens is that the tendons of these muscles, they're going to encircle the joint, which in this case is the shoulder joint, and they will make sure that the head of the humerus stays inside of the glenoid cavity. Remember that the glenoid cavity is a very shallow depression, and so it's easy for the head of the humerus to come out of this joint. That's why it's important to have all these tendons working together to hold the head of the humerus in place, different from the acetabulum and the head of the femur because the acetabulum is a very deep depression, so it holds the head of the femur better when compared to the shoulder joint. Therefore, we can say that the only muscle that's not part of the rotator cuff muscles is going to be the teres major because it sort of sits outside. The way that I remember, especially when we look at the lab models, is that the minor will always be together with the other muscles. So we can say that minors cannot go by themselves unaccompanied and therefore the major is the one that's by itself. And in addition, it's not part of the rotator cuffs. Now, with regards to the separate functions of these muscles, the supraspinatus, because it's located a little bit more above, so in a similar location to the deltoid, it will also do abduction at the shoulder. The infraspinatus will pull your arm back, and therefore it will do lateral rotation at the shoulder. And because the subscapularis is located anteriorly, it will do medial rotation at the shoulder. Now the teres minor will also do lateral rotation at the shoulder because it's located right next to the infraspinatus. And in addition to that, it will do adduction at the shoulder. So it will pull, as we can see, the arm closer to the body. And the teres major, it will extend and medially rotate at the shoulder. Another muscle that will do extension of the arm at the shoulder is the latissimus dorsi. And the latissimus dorsi is this huge muscle right over here, and we can see it over here as well. And there's a little part of it that will come and insert on the humerus, more specifically close to the intertubercular sulcus of the humerus. Therefore, it will also cause extension. Now it's a little bit confusing extension and flexion at the shoulder because when our arm is in an anatomical position like we see over here, it is actually at 180 degrees from the sagittal plane. So this is your sagittal plane. If we were to raise our arm up, this would be decreasing this angle over here. But since our arm is positioned down, it means that this angle over here is bigger, is 180 degrees from the sagittal plane. So when we talk about arm flexion, we're talking about raising your arm above your head. We're not talking about arm extension, we're talking about bringing your arm back to anatomical position. And when we talk about hyperextension of the arm, then we talk about bringing our arm even further back from anatomical position. So I know it's a little bit confusing, but just remember that our arm in anatomical position is at 180 degrees of the sagittal plane.
So now you can understand how the teres major will do extension of the arm as it brings the arm closer to the body if the arm is further up in this direction. Here I'm highlighting the latissimus dorsi and notice how there's a little bit of the muscle that will insert on the humerus and therefore it will be able to do extension as it pulls that arm back and in addition it does adduction because it pulls it closer to the body and it also does medial rotation because it will be inserted in the intertubercular groove or sulcus which is located anteriorly. So when it pulls it back, it's able to immediately rotate the arm. On the lab model, we can clearly see the latissimus dorsi, which I had already talked about, which is this huge muscle over here. And on a section of it right over here, all of this will be your latissimus dorsi. And on this transverse cut, we have identified, remember, this will be your rector spinae group. This is your psoas major. This is your quadratus lumborum. And notice how behind the latissimus dorsi over here, you're going to have the erector spinae group. So this muscle over here is your latissimus dorsi that will come around behind the erector spinae group. So this one over here, latissimus dorsi. On the lab model for the upper limb, we can definitely see the deltoid over here. All of this would be the deltoid. On this limb is the deltoid over here. And if we remove the deltoid, this is what we have. Notice how this hand is posterior. So this will be a posterior view. And on a close-up of this model, we can see the deltoid in a more lateral position. In addition, on the lab model, we can see the supraspinatus, which is going to be above the spine of the scapula, the infraspinatus, which is all of this, this will be your teres minor and the teres major. Remember, the major can be by itself, but the minor needs to be with the others. Therefore, this is part of the rotator cuff muscles on the posterior side, and the subscapularis will be the other muscle that's part of the rotator cuff on the anterior side, and we will see that later on. On these model, we have seen some of them already, but this would be your pectoralis major. Underneath the pectoralis major, you have the pectoralis minor. Again, pectoralis major. And if we remove this cap over here, we can see over here the pectoralis major. Underneath would be the pectoralis minor. And then the third layer that we see over here would be your serratus anterior that will insert anteriorly on the ribs, on top of the ribs. And we can see a little bit of it coming over here. So this would be your serratus anterior that looks like a little serrated knife, and it will be inserting onto the ribs anteriorly. So that's why it's called serratus anterior. As we move on to group three, there are a couple of muscles that actually cross two joints. They cross the shoulder joint and they cross the elbow joint. So I've placed them here under group two and group three. And this would be your biceps brachii and your triceps brachii. The biceps brachii, like the name says, it will have two heads. There's a short head and a long head, and it is going to be located anteriorly. The triceps brachii has three heads, like the name says, tri. So there will be a lateral head, a long head, and a medial head, which is a little bit hard to see. With regards to the biceps brachii, both heads will cross the shoulder joint. The long head will originate on the tubercle above the glenoid cavity of the scapula, and the short head will originate on the coracoid process of the scapula. So both of them do originate on the scapula, and the biceps brachii will insert on the radius. Now the triceps brachii, only the long head will be the one that will cross the shoulder joint. The other two, they will originate on the humerus. Therefore, they will only cross the elbow joint and they will insert on the ulna. So the biceps brachii, both heads cross the shoulder joint, and then it will insert on the radius. The triceps brachii, 
only the long head crosses the shoulder joint. All the others, they originate on the humerus. Therefore, they will only cross one joint, which is the elbow joint, as they insert on the ulna. But it is safe to say that both will do an action at the shoulder and an action at the elbow. The biceps brachii, it will flex at the shoulder. As you can see, it's moving your arm up. So if it moves your arm up, you're actually flexing it because you're bringing it to the sagittal plane because you're decreasing the angle at the sagittal plane. And it will also flex at the elbow. The triceps brachii will do the opposite. It will extend at the shoulder and also extend at the elbow. Because remember, these are antagonistic to each other. So when one flexes, the other one extends. Here we can see a little bit more detail how this will be your long head of the biceps brachii that goes all the way across the scapula and it will insert on the tubercle that's above the glenoid cavity and the short head will originate right over here on the coracoid process. Therefore, it crosses the shoulder joint and it also crosses the elbow joint and it will insert on more specifically the radial tuberosity of the radius. Another thing that we can notice is how the long head of the biceps brachii will pass right in that groove which is called the intertubercular groove or bicipital groove or sulcus. So now you can see how things are coming together where the bone features that you learn will be important for you to understand with regards to muscle attachments. Here on this slide, you guys will be able to see on your PowerPoint how the biceps brachii will flex at the elbow. And also, you can see the triceps brachii extending at the elbow. On the next slide, I will be able to show you the triceps brachii, but the biceps, I wasn't able to make it work. I know, I wish I could take the sound off. I don't know what's happening. But anyway, um, this is what causes extension at the elbow, as we can see the, when the triceps brachii contracts. Perfect. So now we have uh, the muscles that we covered on the previous slides, which were the biceps brachii and the triceps brachii. Notice the positioning of the hand for you to be able to see what's posterior, what's medial, with regards to the pinky will be medial, and what's anterior, you can see the palm of your hand. This will be your biceps brachii right over here. Therefore, on the other side, opposite to it, will be your triceps brachii. Now, you don't need to know the short head, long head, and medial head for the triceps brachii. Just know that all of this will be your triceps brachii over here. Notice how the triceps is a little bit more posterior, as we can already see these structures over here. On an anterior view, we can see the subscapularis right over here which as we know is the other muscle that was missing that's part of the rotator cuff. Moving on to group three, which is going to be muscles that move the forearm at the elbow. There are a few that we need to know. First, we have what we call the brachial radialis. The brachial radialis will, will originate on the brachium, like the name says, brachial, and it will insert on the radius, which is down here. Therefore, it does cross the elbow joint and it will cause flexion at the elbow joint because it's located anteriorly. The other one that we need to know is the brachialis. The brachialis is also located anterior. And notice how most of the muscle is located actually on the humerus. Just a little part of it will cross the elbow joint. But because it's located anterior, and it will pull towards the origin, which is over here on the humerus. It will cause flexion at the elbow. Then we have a couple more that we need to know, which are the pronator teres and the supinator. The pronator teres, it will pronate your arm at the elbow, and the supinator will bring your arm back to anatomical position. So this will be your supinator 
over here and all of this will be your pronator so this will be your pronator and on the next slide we will be able to see a little bit of the action of these muscles before i do the animation one thing that i want you to notice is how the pronator terrace will originate on the medial side more specifically on the medial epicondyle so when it contracts it's able to swing the radius on top of the ulna so that's how it does the pronation and the supinator is the opposite it will originate on the lateral epicondyle of the humerus that way it's able to swing back the radius to its anatomical position so let's look at the video recording on the next few slides here we have the pronator terrace notice that when it highlights it's when it's pronating the radius so it's moving the radius on top of the ulna and the thumb will then be located medially instead of lateral how it is in anatomical position with regards to the supinator you can see when it contracts it will bring the radius back to anatomical position here we can see the muscle compartments that's what i was talking about and the muscles that belong to the same compartment will probably have the same function posteriorly on the arm we have the triceps brachii we know that the triceps brachii will all function as extensors all of the different heads and in the anterior compartment we can see two different muscles the biceps brachii and the brachialis and both of them will be flexors next we have what we call the muscles that belong to group four which are the ones that will move the hand at the wrist if they are going to move the hand at the wrist they definitely need to cross the wrist joint they can either originate on the humerus and therefore they will be crossing the elbow joint as well or they can originate on the radius or the ulna and just insert on the carpal or metacarpals and therefore they will be crossing the wrist joint and moving the hand on the interior view we can see the pronator terrace that we had talked about already we can see a little bit of the biceps brachii we can see the brachioradialis over here so this means this is the radial side and then we have three muscles that we need to know we have the flexor carpi radialis which will be going to the radial side we have the one in the middle which will be the palmaris longus which will go to the palm of your hand and the one that's more medial will be the flexor carpi oneris so the name already tells you what the function is and where it's going to on which side so flexor means it's going to flex carpi is for the carpals and radialis means that it will be inserting on the radial side same thing for flexor carpi oneris but this time it will be inserting on the ulna side so the medial side and the palmaris longus it's telling you that it's going to the palm of your hand and it's a very long muscle so these three are important for you to know in addition on the posterior side we're going to have the extensors notice how this is the thumb so this would be the radial side there are going to be two that will go to the radial side we have the extensor carpi radialis longus extensor carpi radialis brevis notice how both of them are going to the thumb another thing that i want you to observe is how one is called longus and one is called brevis and this has to do with the size of the tendon and not the size of the muscle notice how on the longus this is where the tendon starts and it goes all the way down and on the brevis the tendon starts over here so it has a shorter tendon so that's why the extensor carpi radialis longus is called longus because it has a longer tendon so it does not have to do with the size of the muscle but the size of the tendon then right here in the middle we have what we call the extensor digitorum notice how it's going to branch out all these tendons meaning that it will go to all the other digits except for the thumb 
Then we have what we call the extensor digiti minimi, meaning that there is a specific muscle that will go to your pinky to be able to extend your pinky. And then we have one that will go to the owner side, the extensor carpi onerus. So two radialis, the extensor carpi radialis longus, the extensor carpi radialis brevis. One that will go to all the digits except for the pollex, which is the extensor digitorum. One that will go specifically to your pinky, which is the extensor digiti minimi and one that's going to the owner side, which is the extensor carpi oneris. And these are located posteriorly or on the dorsal side. Therefore, they are doing extension. If they're located on the anterior side, they will do flexion. Let's look at these muscles on the lab models. So I know this is an anterior view. I can see the palm of the hand. And this would be a posterior view because I can see the dorsal part of the hand. So on the anterior view, we will be able to see the flexors. On the posterior view, we will be able to see the extensors. I like to start with the thumb because I know this big one over here is going to be the brachial radialis. Then I'm going to have the pronator teres, the flexor carpi radialis going to the thumb, the palmaris longus, which will go to the palm of the hand, and then more medially will be the flexor carpi onerus. So again, we have the brachial radialis, which is this big muscle, pronator teres, notice how it's at a different angle because it will pronate the forearm, then we have the flexor carpi radialis, the palmaris longus, and the flexor carpi ulnaris going to the pinky. Another way that you can remember is pass, fail, pass, fail. The first pass for pronator teres, notice how the angle of the muscle is different because it will pronate. The first fail is the flexor carpi radialis. The second pass will be the palmaris longus, and the second fail will be the flexor carpi ulnaris. For the extensors, if we start with the thumb, we're gonna have two that will go to the radial side. And since it's a posterior view, then these are extensors. So the first one will be your extensor carpi radialis longus, the second one is your extensor carpi radialis brevis. The one in the middle, which is this big one right over here, is going to be your extensor digitorum. Then the little tiny one that will go to the pinky is this one right over here, extensor digiti minimi. And then the other one that goes to the pinky will be your extensor carpi onerus. So again, we have the extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor digitorum, extensor digiti minimi, and extensor carpi onerus. Here will be an animation of the flexors and the extensors. Notice how the flexors will originate on the medial epicondyle and the extensors will originate on the lateral epicondyle. Notice how this muscle crosses the wrist joint and it, because it goes all the way to the digits, it will flex the digits as well. So it can flex the wrist and it can flex the digits. And this muscle is the flexor digitorum superficialis, which will be located underneath all the flexors that we talked about. I know another one that has a song on the background, but this is your flexor carpi radialis, and as you can see, it will flex at the wrist. The last group is what we call group five, which will move the digits, and these will be your flexor digitorum profundus. Profundus means that it's going to be deep, and the rest of the name tells you that it's going to flex the digits. Therefore, it's telling you exactly what it's doing. 
And then we have specific muscles that will move your pollux, which will have pollicis in them. So this will be your flexor pollicis longus going to your thumb, and it will flex your thumb. Then we have what we call the extensor digitorum on the posterior side, and an extensor digiti minimi, which we already talked about. So these will also extend the digits. Then we have specific ones on the posterior side for the thumb. These will be the abductor pollicis longus, so it will bring your thumb away. The extensor pollicis longus, so it will stretch your thumb. And the extensor pollicis brevis. The extensor pollicis brevis is squished in between the extensor pollicis longus and the abductor pollicis longus. So it makes like a little sandwich of the extensor pollicis brevis. But all of them will go directly to your thumb because they have pollicis in them. And then it tells you exactly the function. Abduction means it moves it away. Extensor means that it stretches it out, like when you're doing a thumbs up. On the model for the lab, we can see underneath your flexor carpi radialis and your palmaris longus, right over here, this would be your flexor digitorum superficialis, which we saw on the previous um, animation. And you can see a little bit of it over here. So I have removed these top muscles, superficial muscles, and you can see the flexor digitorum superficialis that runs in between the muscles. You can see a little bit of it over here. This would be your flexor pollicis longus. And here on the posterior side, you're gonna have the abductor pollicis longus, the extensor pollicis brevis, and the extensor pollicis longus. Notice how the extensor pollicis brevis is going to be squished between the abductor and the extensor pollicis longus. Again, with regards to the muscle compartments, now we're talking about the muscles that are located in the forearm. These will belong to groups four and five. Therefore, the muscles that move the hand at the wrist or the muscles that move the digits. If they're located posteriorly, they will all extend. And if they're located anteriorly, independent, if it's deep or superficial, they will all flex. So they're all flexors. So this makes it easy for you to understand their function if you know exactly where they are located. Now notice how we have all these different tendons that are coming from all these muscles that will move your digits they need to pass through this little tunnel over here. We talked about the carpal tunnel earlier, but they're going to be held together by what we call this tendon sheath, which is called the flexor retinaculum, in this case of the hand. And we do have one on the posterior side, since this is the anterior side, which will be called extensor retinaculum of the hand. So they will hold all these tendons in place.